Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Professor Trevor Darrow, and I'm really happy to be here at the uh, CBPR workshop L2ID uh, and to share with you some recent progress on unsupervised adaptation uh, and detection uh, that we have at Berkeley. Uh, there's going to be three presentations today. The first two are going to be our latest work on um, uh, bringing unsupervised learning, the full power of unsupervised learning to detection. And uh, we have two papers, one that imposes region constraints that previously were uh, um, unexplored. Uh, we call it ReSIM, Region Similarity uh, Representation Learning. The second is uh, adding essentially priors from um, unsupervised region knowledge, unsupervised saliency from good old fashioned edges uh, to the process. Uh, and the last is a new state-of-the-art domain adaptation method, which fuses test time adaptation and contrastive augmentation. Uh, Colorado is going to present the first, uh, as I said, region similarity representation learning. We call it ReSIM. And it brings the sort of the constraint that things, as they're transformed, should still map to the same um, concept or the same embedding. The second idea is not just uh, learning representations with uh, appearance augmentation, but bringing back knowledge of regions, region proposals that we can get from unsupervised sources, um, uh, reaching back to, to the notion that um, we can have edge models and, bound, and regions should align with edges and, and edges can be computed from images without um, supervision. Uh, surprisingly, for anyone who was in the field 20 or 30 years ago might know that. Uh, and last uh, but not least, we have uh, our work on on-target adaptation. Um, and here we are uh, uh, expanding a paradigm of um, uh, test time adaptation on a source model uh, together with contrastive learning on the target domain. Uh, and finally, uh, having uh, the target model trained with pseudo labels. So we have the, the best of all of these worlds and get a state of the art uh, performance. So I'm going to hand it off now to uh, Colorado to jump into the uh, first um, presentation. Okay, great. So let's talk about region similarity representation learning. And so with this work, the main thing that we address is that with all of the modern instance discrimination techniques that are coming out, think SimClear or Mocha or Bio, suave, they focus on learning global views of an entire image. When we do this, what happens is we take two different augmentations of an input image, say this dog, for example, and we divide them into a query and a key view. And we use some convolutional network to do an encoding, and then we end up with a feature map. Say with a resonant 50, this would be a seven by seven uh, feature map, convolutional feature map, that we then average pool into say a 128 dimensional vector and compute a similarity of some sort. Different instance discrimination techniques or self-supervised techniques use different measures of similarity, but essentially they're all doing this. The problem is that this average pooling discards the spatial information that's present in the convolutional layers, in the convolutional feature maps. And this spatial information is what's used in downstream tasks that have some component of localization. Think object detection or segmentation. The whole idea of region proposal networks or in faster RCNN and these types of techniques are to leverage the localized information in those convolutional feature maps in order to do tasks such as object detection. So let's go ahead and explode out this view a bit into region similarity representation learning. So this is the same thing I just showed. The only difference here is that we've exploded out this middle part to show explicitly the convolutional layers. So we have convolutional layer three, four, and five. And we've shaded also the input image to show that a query and a key view have an overlapping region that's highlighted. Right. And so what region similarity representation learning does is after each of the later stage convolutional feature map layers, we take a sliding window, a region, over the convolutional feature map itself across the two different views such that the region is in the exact same location across the different augmentations or sca uh, scale variants. So in this case, we have the dog's face here and we have the dog's face here. Even though the regions look different, they're covering the same spot. And we enforce at the convolutional layers with the convolutional feature maps that these spatial features have a similarity that is then learned as part of the training process itself. And so we do these at each of the different layers. And additionally, we can add in 
uh, a semantic global view, such as the SimClear MoCo style instance contrastive training at the end, and even back propagate those features as indicated by the blue arrows using a feature pyramid networks, FPNs. So this together uh, results in learning convolutional features that have a spatial uh, and semantic consistency throughout the convolutional feature maps themselves. Effectively, it's an explicit constraint where before we were trying to use an implicit constraint. And because we're doing these region level features, the negatives in the example that we have that uses negatives can be different. So the negatives from an individual image can just be different patches within that image. And of course we can use patches from any spot in a different image. And so this creates a different uh, scenario and actually allows us to alleviate some of the batch size constraints and so forth. And you can read about that in more detail in the paper. And just briefly looking at a couple of results. So on downstream tasks such as Pascal, which is, as we know, a very saturated benchmark, we still managed to outperform a supervised baseline by 5.7 points and a competitive MoCo v2 and concurrent work such as dense CL baselines by uh, two, two-ish points as well. What's really exciting about this work, I think when we look at leveraging spatial consistency and information throughout the training process is how it can lead to improvements in localization itself. And we see this improvement with two different variants of ReSIM. Uh, as we measure the IOU threshold, or sorry, as we measure the AP as a function of the IOU threshold. So as we require that we're able to localize our objects better for the Pascal VOC detection task, we can see that the improvement of our two recent implementations over a MoCo v2 baseline improves substantially as we have and require better localization. And so this shows that the localization consistency we're learning, in fact, benefits the localization performance on our downstream tasks. And so if you'd like to read more, uh, please check out our archive paper here or uh, chat with me after the workshop. Thanks a lot, Colorado. So that shows us how um, localization consistency is a win for detection. Um, and now we bring a complementary approach uh, with uh, region prior information that we can have from unsupervised sources in the work that Amir will present. Hi everyone, and thanks again for having us in the workshop. So our work builds on the previous one and similarly, our goal is to improve object detection using unsupervised pre-training. And when we look at prior works, which we heavily build on, it is mainly focused on training backbones, which on the one hand is very general, but on the other hand, misses a key aspect of object detection, detecting objects. Obviously, if you try to plug in a backbone into an existing detection architecture, it won't produce anything meaningful without further training. Other works have attempted to learn to localize random regions, which as well does not learn to detect meaningful objects in the pre-training stage. Our goal is to design a model and a pretext task that focus on the detection of objects. So ideally, we should be able to localize objects in the pre-training stage but also learn object representations that can be useful to classify objects. Accordingly, we pre-train a detector with two main targets. The first one is localization for which we try to predict region proposals obtained using selective search, which is available off the shelf, has I recall, and does not require any supervision. Additionally, we try to predict the suave unsupervised embedding of each object proposal. In practice, we pre-train our detector to predict a set of objects, and for each object, we predict its bounding box, embedding, and probability. As mentioned earlier, we supervise the training using region proposals obtained from selective search and using unsupervised object embeddings obtained using suave. With this, we can pre-train our, our detector and we use the deformable DTR detector as our detection architecture. After the pre-training stage, we fine tune uh, the detector on different data sets uh, of different sizes. 
This simple training procedure leads to improved detection performance, both after the pre-training stage and in general across multiple data sets. When fine-tuning Dietrich over Pascal, we see very nice improvements on average precision, both when using 10% of the data and when using the full data. Most significantly, we see 8.5 points improvements on AP when using 10% of the data compared to the supervised counterpart. We also see nice improvements uh, compared to unsupervised retraining works on the full Pascal data set. On COCO, we see significant gains when using limited amounts of data. For example, when using only 1% of the data when fine tuning, we observe seven points improvements on average precision. With large amounts of annotated data as expected, we see more minor improvements. We also test Dietrich in a few shot setting and observe very large gains in the, in the 30 shot setting where our pre-training procedure improves by seven points on average precision compared to past works. To gain, better under, to gain a better understanding of what Dietrich learns, we produce salinity maps to show the areas in the image that influences the prediction the most. When predicting the coordinates of images, we generally see that the vertical or horizontal boundaries of the image affect it the most. And for the object embedding, we see that the actual object or the background around it usually affect the output embedding the most. Thank you for listening and check out our project page for code and pre-trained models, which will be released soon. Okay, thank you, Amir. That was a fantastic presentation on adding region priors to unsupervised detection learning. Uh, and now we're going to uh, pivot from uh, unsupervised uh, detection to state-of-the-art adaptation, a method we call on-target adaptation, and Deshwan will present this work. Hi, everyone. I'm Deshwan Wang, uh, PhD with Trevor Dairo. Uh, today, it's my pleasure to, to introduce our recent work on target adaptation. This is a joint work with Shelton, Sana, Ivan, and Trevor. Before I jump into the details of, about our method, there are several related works to bridge the gap between training and testing data. First of all, fine tuning on the labeled target data is direct and simple if the target is already annotated. Then the family of unsupervised domain annotation is proposed to reduce the demand for target domain, uh, target domain annotation. And recently, the several self-supervised, uh, you know, method, for example, the rotation prediction, location prediction, and so on, are introduced as a proxy tasks to augment the representation learning. All three approaches have uh, have their own space, but if they do not address all the practical setting, for example, what if they only have uh, the uh, su supervised model and a unlabeled target data? So how we deal with that scenario. So that is our fully test time adaptation setting. Previously, we proposed a tent updating model via intermediation in, in an online manner. And in this talk, we will introduce uh, the stronger offline method on target adaptation. So in general, our, our method only needs uh, one, the first uh, the unlabeled target data and the second uh, supervised, uh, supervised model. Compared with the fine tuning, we do not need any annotation of target samples. Compared with uh, the unsupervised domain adaptation, we do not need the source data to finish uh, a joint training. And meanwhile, we do not need the target data during the training time. Compared to the self supervision, we do not need to you know, modify the training procedure. Like we do not need the task engineering, like choosing a proper uh, accelerate loss or multitask of pre training. And surprisingly, our on target adaptation additionally leverage contrastive learning. Uh, we use MoCo in this paper and the teacher student transfer. We use a fixed match here. Now let's jump into the detail about our on target adaptation. 
the goal of our uh, you know on target adaptation is to tackle the domain shift during the test time with only a source model with all the access of annotation and the source data so specifically a supervised model with source parameter trained on source image and labels need to generate on tar on label target data when uh, um, when uh, when a domain shift happened our own target adaptation is proposed to obtain the a uh, target a uh, target model purely during test time. The proposed on-target adaptation framework can be split into four, uh, four stage. The, the stage zero, we train a supervised model with source image and labels. And stage one, we adapt source model during test time in, a, on, in an unsupervised way. And it, uh, stage, set, uh, stage two, like we initialize a targeted model with contrastive learning on unlabeled targeted image. And finally, we transfer knowledge from teacher model to student model via semi-supervised learning. So starting with uh, uh, the source only model as a baseline, you can see our test time adaptation at st stage one brings a significant improvement on top of the source model. For example, for the VSDAC, we improve the number from 21 to 31, give you 10 point absolute improvement. And uh, then like the teacher student, uh, framework as a stage three and also illustrated here leverage a source only or test time adapted a model as an initial teacher model um, here like we named the model which generates the student label as a teacher model and the model which learn from student label as a student model so the student model like whether it's a source or contrastive learned model is trained with a pseudo label generated by teacher after several phases of transfer learning, the student outperformed the initialized teacher, uh, initial, initial teacher by a large margin. For example, here, you can see from the base DAC, we, we improved the number from 31 to, to the 43, like a bring back another around like over 10 point uh, improvement, just, just uh, you know, thanks to the you know, teacher student interaction. And furthermore, the contrastive learning defeat is the, the feature at the stage two, like the illustrated here, uh, you know, is helping to, you know, further improve your, you know, performance, like transferring efficiency with a more, you know, target centric representation, like to start with. For example, the number here, like from the 33 to the 39, uh, the, the, 43 to the 49, you can see you give you another six points on top of the previous, you know, the best practice. So like uh, on summary, like we propose on target adaptation, which give you the state of the art unsupervised implementation without the access of source model, uh, the source data and without a requirement on the target domain annotation. Thanks. Great. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Deshwan. That's a great talk. I just want to close uh, the presentation. Thank uh, Colorado and Amir and Deshwan for their excellent presentations. Uh, and you know, summarize the theme here, which was unsupervised detection adaptation. Two methods uh, that bring uh, unsuper bring unsupervised um, uh, learning for uh, detection uh, and uh, and Deshwan's method that brings uh, together test time adaptation and contrastive augmentation for domain adaptation. Um, thanks very much. If you're interested, uh, the first two methods are already on archive and the last is coming soon. So feel free to reach out to Deshwan or myself if, uh, if you can't find that uh, shortly. Thanks very much, everyone. <laughs>